much. Uh, it's a special privilege for me to introduce uh, Dr. Hai Musk to you today. Uh, he recently joined our faculty as the uh, director of geriatric oncology at the Lineberger. Um, just a little bit about him to, to, to put him in context here. He is a native of Brooklyn where he uh, grew up. He, after high school, went to Lafayette College and received a BA in chemistry and then uh, went to the State University of New York in Brooklyn uh, at Downstate Medical Center and uh, received his MD. This was followed by residency at the Brigham uh, and then a fellowship uh, in hematology at the Brigham, following which he did work in oncology in research and clinical oncology at Dana-Farber. And following that, he uh, went into a research career, which has been very highly successful. He was on the faculty at Wake Forest for uh, 22 years and was the associate director of clinical research there. Went from there to the University of Vermont, where he was on the faculty for about 13 years and again uh, a director of uh, clinical research. And then was recruited by Shelley Earp uh, and Rich Goldberg here to be the director of geriatric oncology. Uh, his career focus has really been on the tr management and treatment of cancer in the elderly, especially breast cancer in the elderly, as you'll see from his talk today. He's widely published in this area. I was just reviewing his CV. It's amazing how much he's written about this. Uh, and he's, he's really excelled in clinical care, research, uh, and teaching. And the only other thing I would say quickly is what I've learned already about High is that he has tremendous enthusiasm and energy for what he does, and I think you'll see that as he talks to you today. So thank you. Hi. Well, thank you so much. Uh, it's a privilege to be here. Uh, it's great to be on the UNC faculty. I feel very fortunate. Uh, I come from Vermont, um, and it's not hard to see why I'm here. Uh, this was a average spring day before my wife shoveled, and uh, uh, it, it's really nice to be here. I'm kind of looking, is there a pointer? Um, the mouse. Oh, that's fine, yeah. So, uh, just disclosure, uh, uh, I have been a consultant or advisor for several uh, uh, industry uh, sponsors. Uh, new drug development, and right now I receive no direct uh, research funding from industry. So today we're going to talk about uh, epidemiology of breast cancer, a little bit about comorbidity, coexisting illness in older patients with breast cancer. We're going to talk then about adjuvant therapy, clinical trials, and what are we doing at UNC? What are our plans at UNC for older women with breast cancer and older patients with cancer in general? So why do we need to care about older people with breast cancer? Uh, what's so uh, unique about them? Well, first, our life expectancy is increasing. So if we look here at 1900, the average woman lived to be about 50. Uh, and uh, in the year 2000, uh, people were already 80. And now, in 2050, the average life expectancy will be about 85 uh, for a woman. So we're living longer and longer. Uh, and the real push and the real Im improvement in longevity has been in the second half of the 20th century, went up about 20 years after 1950. The other thing now is that we've realized is breast cancer is a disease of aging. If you go to sub-Saharan Africa, you see some patients with breast cancer, but not very many because of other serious coexisting disease, a population of men and women there, for instance, die very young. But if you look in the United States, you'll see that breast cancer and all cancers increase with age. So when you watch TV and you see, let's say, a big uh, telethon on cancer, it's usually celebrities who are 25 to 30. It's Jennifer Aniston. But real people who have breast cancer on average are much older. And the average age of cancer in the United States is 67, 67. And the average age of breast cancer is 63. So uh, it, it's a real uh, difference what the public perception is and what the numbers are. And the other thing here is you can see in the yellow bars that breast cancer dramatically rises with age and the mortality rate goes up with age. So most people who die of breast cancer now in the United States are 65 years and older. The other thing that's different is if you see a patient in your office now who's 65, 
they have an average survival of about 20 years. And even if someone's 85 and comes in and they're in good health, they have an average survival of six years. When FDR signed Social Security in 1935, he did it because Huey Long was on his back, populism, he needed to win the election, had to do something for the public. The average uh, age in 1935 of the population was about 55 to 60. And so no one thought we would have all these 65-year-old people. But now it's a major issue for the Social Security system, for medicine in general, manpower shortages, especially in geriatrics. But you're going to see these patients. And when they come in healthy at 65, many of them are going to live many years more. This is the public image. So uh, this is Kylie Minogue. She's a very popular actress, gets breast cancer, goes on TV. Uh, and you see this uh, person like this. And this becomes the public image of breast cancer. And all young women really worry about their breast cancer. But this is the real image of breast cancer. So this is Nancy Reagan. Uh, and she got breast cancer at 64. And this is much more typical of what we see for breast cancer in the population. She is really the iconic age for the average age of breast cancer in our culture. Now, when you see an older person with breast cancer, the real question is, is breast cancer the major illness? For instance, we'll see a patient who has a very tiny breast cancer. They're 85 years old. They're brought in by their daughter. They're on 26 medications. And everybody is worried about this tiny little breast cancer. But in reality, it's highly unlikely that breast cancer is going to be the cause of mortality for that patient. So when we see an older patient, we're much more likely to see patients who have lots of other illnesses, diabetes, heart disease, that are really competing for mortality with the breast cancer. And it's very important to keep that in perspective. So here are two patients the same age. Uh, the fellow on the left is in a wheelchair, maybe in his 80s. He's got a poor outlook, and he's got a lot of coexisting illnesses. On the right is a person of similar age who's doing great. So age really is an important thing, but really the key thing is comorbidity and expected survival. Not how old is the patient, but what's their anticipated survival. And when you think about it, it's true for a 30-year-old. If you see a 30-year-old patient with diabetes who already has terrible vascular disease and is on dialysis, that patient has a miserable outcome, even though they're 30. So the question is estimated survival. If you look at how many illnesses older people have, uh, there have been several excellent studies. So this study by Rosemary Yancic, uh, looking at patients and comorbidities in women with breast cancer, show that if you have a patient 65 to 69, about 20 to 30 percent of them have one or more coexisting illnesses that's up on the slide. Those are important because every one of those illnesses shortens your survival. So if you have uh, had a previous malignancy, if you have diabetes or COPD, we know from great actuarial data and census data your survival is shortened. So 65 to 69, it's one. And then if you get into your 80s, probably about 30 to 50% of the population have at least one or more comorbidities that's related to shortening their survival. So it's very important to get a handle on these uh, and realize that these are going to compete with mortality with your patient with breast cancer. Now, a lot of people uh, feel that there are differences in biology of breast cancer with age that really have uh, major meaning on the population and on survival. And here's the SEER data. This is on 85,000 patients. So on the left, uh, on your left, if you look, uh, we have age on the x-axis, and then we have risk of dying of uh, risk of death uh, from breast cancer causes uh, on the y-axis. And you can see really between 40 and the late 80s. If you take and you look at the triangles, which are different TNM stages, they're kind of the same, irrespective of age. So a 50-year-old woman with a breast cancer that's similar in characteristics to an 80-year-old woman has about the same general survival probability. On the other hand, if you look on the right panel, you have age on the x-axis, and the y-axis is actually logarithmic, and that's the relative risk of dying of a non-breast cancer versus breast cancer cause. 
So if we look at the red line, T2N0, that's a patient with a tumor 2 to 5 centimeters. And if you look at a 65-year-old patient, she has about a 50-50 chance of dying of breast cancer or something else. But if you have a patient with the same tumor characteristics who is now 85, the probability is 3 to 1 that that patient is going to die of a non-breast cancer cause. So get older, more comorbidity, more probability of dying of something else as opposed to breast cancer. Now what about adjuvant treatment in older people? And when we talk about adjuvant treatment, we mean giving either radiation or we'll talk more about systemic therapy, endocrine therapy or chemotherapy in women with early stage breast cancer to improve their probability of survival. And this is just general data uh, on stage of breast cancer and survival, uh, which generally shows if you did surgery only and you had a patient uh, who had no lymph nodes involved, uh, that between 60 and 95 percent of those patients are going to live 10 years. If you have people with metastatic breast cancer, very few of them survive 10 years, although some uh, do, uh, and sometimes even much longer. So you can generally see with surgery alone, we have uh, variable data as your stage goes up, your chances of dying of breast cancer get higher. So the concept of adjuvant therapy is to try to give treatments, hormonal therapy with drugs like tamoxifen or chemotherapy, to try to kill what we know are micrometastases, metastatic disease that we can't detect with any imaging or other procedure, but which eventually will grow back and take the life of the patient. So this is the same concept as in colon cancer uh, and many other cancers. So what we've learned is older people have recurrence risks for cancer similar to younger patients when they're age adjusted. There are some subtle differences that I'll show you. Life expectancy is really the key issue. Life expectancy is based on comorbidity. And we should consider healthy older people for the same treatments as younger patients. Now this is provided they have a reasonable life expectancy and are in good condition. So now we're going to turn a little bit more into breast cancer and how we would treat older patients. And essentially, uh, breast cancer I like to think of today, and actually UNC, Dr. Peru, Dr. Carey, and many of the people in the breast program here are leaders in defining breast cancer more biologically today than stage. And essentially, there are three types of breast cancers. There's this huge, large group, which is about 70% of the population, which have hormone receptor positive tumors. And they are the vast majority of patients, especially older patients. They also uh, lack overexpression of the HER2 gene, so they're HER2 negative. And this is most of the patients we see. Now, they're the most complicated group in a way because they have a tremendous, tremendously variable biology. And I mean by that, some of these people do great with minimum therapy, and some of these patients really do poorly. Uh, even with the best endocrine therapy and chemotherapy. So Dr. Peru actually and colleagues here were leaders in this field and have divided this group into kind of two groups. Luminal A, uh, which simplistically means uh, cancer cells, epithelial cancer cells. They're really very rich in hormone receptors and very favorable biologic characteristics. And as far as endocrine therapy, and luminal B. These are patients who are still estrogen and progesterone receptor positive, but they have uh, less expression of hormone receptors and other unfavorable biologic characteristics. And even with the best endocrine therapy, tamoxifen, aromatase inhibitors have a high probability of relapse. And we'll get to the other two groups as we move on. So there are subtle differences as we age in the breast cancer population. This is looking uh, at really uh, several thousand patients by decades of age. And if you look 55 to 64, 85 plus, et cetera. And you can see that if we look at the frequency of being node negative, it's a little higher. And these numbers are all statistically significantly different, but they're clinically about the same. Uh, so yes, you're likely to be a little bit more likely to be uh, node negative as we get older, a little bit more likely to be ER positive, 
a little bit uh, more likely to have a slower growing tumor and less likely to overexpress HER2. Uh, but there aren't vast differences in age, and that's why in the previous slide, when you adjust for size in lymph nodes, there aren't dramatic differences in mortality rates. The, but what's very important is the, kind of the fundamental biology. So years ago, when a woman got out five years from breast cancer, she would come into the clinic and we'd all congratulate her. You made your five years, you're going to do great. And everybody went home and they were very happy. And today what we know is if you have hormone receptor positive breast cancer, which is this black line down here, that, and you take a drug like tamoxifen for five years, which saves lives, what we've learned is that at five years, Yes, your risk is down a lot, but actually most of the relapses are going to occur after five years, every woman's greatest nightmare. So these tumors that are more favorable biologically because they're hormone receptor positive have a different really uh, natural history, different kinetics, and they don't relapse very quickly. But after five years, there's a constant small relapse rate. So by 15 and 20 years, they have the same relapse rate as if they were hormone receptor negative. And these are the patients who come in at 12 years and have a bone met or something else, and it's really a great shock and really an overwhelming experience because they thought they were going to be cured of their breast cancer. In contrast are these patients here who are hormone receptor negative. Uh, these patients frequently are also HER2 negative, what we call triple negative patients. And UNC is a leader in defining this group. Dr. Carey and her colleagues really are uh, some of the major players worldwide, uh, right from the Lineberger and UNC. And you can see these patients relapse quickly. These are hazard ratios on the y-axis. So what happens to these patients is they either relapse in the five, first five years. If they get out after five years, they have a very low relapse rate. So these are patients that really do poorly. When they get out five years, they should go out and celebrate because their probability of a recurrence is very low after that. Now, most of the older people we see are going to be hormone receptor positive. They're going to be on this lower curve. So in a way, that's beneficial for them because if they're 85 and they have a small tumor, they're not likely to get out 20 years and worry about late recurrences. So it changes a little bit of the management. Now, the drug that has probably saved more lives from breast cancer than anything else, including all the chemotherapy, is tamoxifen, which is now $10 for three months at Walmart. It's, uh, it's a great deal. It's probably one of the most cost-effective drugs for any serious illness. And irrespective of age here, you can see that tamoxifen dramatically reduces your risk of recurrence of breast cancer by about half, and your risk of dying of breast cancer by 30 to 40 percent. Now, there's always a little difference in recurrence and death. Why? Some people will recur with breast cancer or get a new breast cancer, and then they'll die of hypertension-related complications. So mortality rates are always going to be a little less than recurrence rates for breast cancer or other cancers. But tamoxifen has been uh, dramatically beneficial. Right now, we are uh, using m new drugs called aromatase inhibitors. So essentially what these drugs do is after the menopause, uh, women make estrogen by a mechanism where they make weak androgens from the adrenal gland. They circulate around in the bloodstream, and they're converted in fatty tissue, in muscle, to estrogen. So aromatase inhibitors prevent this conversion of weak androgens to estrogens. And they're only appropriate in postmenopausal women. There's probably been more patients on randomized trials of these drugs and tamoxifen than any other uh, other randomized trials in all of oncology. Probably 50,000 patients on industry-sponsored trials mainly comparing tamoxifen with the three commercially available aromatase inhibitors. And what we've learned is they do, recur they do lower recurrence rates uh, by about 3 to 5 percent compared to tamoxifen in all the trials. But interestingly enough, and especially in older people, they have little benefit on survival, and they're 8 to 10 dollars a tablet. So I can go to Walmart and buy three months of tamoxifen for 10 bucks, or I can buy one or two of these pills there, uh, 
a, a big difference. And so a lot of people fall into the donut hole now, and in spite of uh, the uh, Medicare Modernization Act and uh, drug reimbursement, it's a major problem, the cost of these drugs. However, uh, I'll show some data they're less toxic than tamoxifen frequently, uh, and the national guidelines now suggest using these drugs in all postmenopausal women at some point in the course of their management as part of their adjuvant therapy. Uh, and this includes the American Society of Clinical Oncology, or ASCO, guidelines. So in the trials versus tamoxifen, if you look, at uh, all the composite data. Uh, one of the concerns about tamoxifen is it's a weak it, estrogen as far as the uterus is concerned. So it increases your risk of uterine cancer and you can see that tamoxifen does increase that risk and a lot of older people if you tell them to get pelvic and pap smears yearly on tamoxifen they don't do it. Uh, they tell you on the visit they're going to do it then the next time you see them you ask them they don't do it. Uh, the other thing is, is increases the risk of uterine cancer. There's about 1% risk of uterine cancer for five years of tamoxifen. And there's also in some series increased risk of stroke with tamoxifen and certainly increased risk of blood clots. Uh, weak estrogens, increased risk of blood clotting uh, on tamoxifen. On the other hand, the aromatase inhibitors, and the A here is aromatase inhibitors and T is tamoxifen, the aromatase inhibitors, by depleting that 5 to 15 percent of estradiol uh, uh, that women have postmenopausally compared to their premenopausal levels, causes a lot of arthritis and joint symptoms for reasons that are unclear. And they can be miserable, and sometimes women cannot tolerate the drugs. And also, they accelerate the rate of calcium loss and osteoporosis. Now, most medical oncologists have become good bone doctors. You know, we do bone densities. When I was at University of Vermont, I knew all the techs that did the DEXA scans because the oncologist ordered the most, of, most of them. And the reason was we had lots of patients on these drugs, and we'd get the DEXA scans and monitor them along. So that was really, uh, uh, that's been an important issue. On the other hand, a lot of the older people that we see, especially if they don't have uh, an internist or someone following them for primary care, uh, have never had bone density. So sometimes we're the first people to find out they have osteoporosis or other problems. When we did a study where we looked at uh, toxicity of the aromatase inhibitor letrozole versus a placebo, uh, we had several thousand patients on this study and we looked at numerous complications. But we found if we looked at women above 70, they had no increase in toxicity issues compared to a placebo and that included arthritis, arthralgia, vaginal dryness, hot flashes, et cetera. Uh, and even between 60 and 69, although these numbers are statistically significant, you can see the numbers are kind of close. So uh, the aromatase inhibitors, in my mind, in spite of their increased cost, and that's a major issue, uh, are frequently better choices in older patients because of the toxicity profile and the lack of serious vascular toxicities like stroke, DVT, and the small risk of uterine cancer. What about chemotherapy now in older patients? This is data uh, from the overview analysis. So uh, about 200,000 patients on randomized trials in a large uh, database at Oxford, and every five years they look at how these patients are doing, they collect all the data from all the investigators worldwide, and look at the benefits of treatment. So these are all randomized trials. So chemo versus not. And if you look here at chemo versus not, and you look at the younger women, let's say 40 to 49, chemotherapy reduces the annual odds of having a recurrence of breast cancer 30 to 40 percent and the average odds of dying of breast cancer by about a third. But look here, 60 to 69 drops to 13 percent in these patients. So these uh, data are dominated by women with hormone receptor positive cancer, but you look at that and you say, my God, to lower the recurrence rate a further 10 percent on a patient, let's say their recurrence risk at 10 years is only 10 percent. 
Would you give chemotherapy perhaps to lower that by another percentage point? A lot of people are going to bow out. A lot of doctors, uh, as well as patients, don't feel it's justified, myself included. And if you look above 70, we have even uh, similar data. But in spite of 200,000 patients on randomized trials in this database, there's only 1,000 women 70 and older on chemotherapy trials. So there's been a vast uh, uh, bias in putting these patients on trials. In the older clinical trials, older patients, including 65 and older, which are really young people, were excluded. So we don't have great long-term data on older patients with chemotherapy in trials. So the question we always have in the clinic is what's the added value of chemotherapy in an older patient with a hormone receptor positive tumor? Uh, why give it uh, for that 13% risk reduction uh, with all the potential toxicities? And I won't spend a lot of time on it today, but it's worthy, I think, of another grand rounds at some point. Uh, there are a lot of tools today to help us. There's an online tool called Adjuvant Online that anybody here can sign up for, and you can put in the characteristics of the patient. You can put in the different treatments, and it'll give you uh, estimates, because medical oncologists frequently overestimate the benefits of chemotherapy, and there's good data on that, so this really helps. There's new tests looking at genes. There's Oncotype DX, which is very popular for patients who have uh, no negative breast cancers that are hormone receptor positive that actually predicts the benefits of chemotherapy in those patients. And there are national trials on, he on that. And right here at UNC, there's a PAM-50 assay that's been developed by Dr. Peru and his colleagues and recently published that may be a great lead. Uh, there are other assays I will point out, like MAMA print, which requires fresh tissue. None of these are perfect. And the reason they're not perfect is they don't contain large amounts of data from randomized trials where everybody got hormonal therapy and then people were randomized to chemo or not. So the data is mostly retrospective uh, and we need a lot of uh, further testing here which is in progress. So now moving to the second group of people, this is triple negative breast cancer. Uh, and these are people who have estrogen and progesterone receptors that are lacking, they're ER and PR negative, and they're HER2 negative. The HER2 gene is not overexpressed. So these are patients on the graph before very aggressive cancers. If they're going to relapse, they're going to relapse in five years. So you've got an 80-year-old patient in your office, and she tells you she plays tennis and goes over and uh, you know does activities three times a week. She's got an estimated survival of five to ten years, and she's got a, a large triple negative breast cancer should she receive chemotherapy. Well, it's worthy of considering, because if we look again at this large overview analysis of chemo versus not, and you look here, let's say we'll look at the bottom row, 50 versus 69 years, uh, 50 to 69 years old, about 60 percent of the patients with positive lymph nodes, and you can see that chemotherapy versus not, absolute benefit of about 10 percent. So when you figure there's probably 70, 80,000 new patients with triple negative breast cancer in the United States this year, this is a substantial amount of lives saved. And overall survival, uh, uh, about 6%. And the reason is people die of other causes. So um, triple negative breast cancer really gets a tremendous uh, bang for the buck with chemotherapy. And the more aggressive the chemotherapy, uh, the better the outcomes. So an older person who is in good shape should certainly be considered uh, if she has a triple negative breast cancer. Uh, and it's a larger cancer for treatment like this. And then the last group of patients who are HER2 positive. And these patients, even if they're hormone receptor positive, tend to have a more aggressive breast cancer. And what we've learned about these patients, that the use of a drug called trastuzumab, which is a monoclonal antibody that reacts with the transmembrane uh, protein uh, that's transcribed by the HER2 gene, that the addition of trastuzumab to chemotherapy has reduced the risk of recurrence by about half compared to the chemotherapy alone. Trastuzumab has been one of the few home runs in breast cancer in my career. Breast cancer is doing much better overall, mortality rate, but it's been slow, uh, small steps. 
it's been singles, it's been bunts, it hasn't been home run. But Trastuzumab really has been a home run. And here are four series where you can see the hazard ratios uh, all about the same uh, with Trastuzumab therapy. The problem is it's a cardiotoxic drug for reasons that are not quite certain. And the, inc the risk of cardiac toxicity goes up with increasing age. So if you look at this slide and you look at age, and you, for instance, look at the left ventricular ejection fraction done by echo or MUGA scanning, and you pick this box over here. There's not lots of uh, patients here, but up to 20% of patients had some drop in ejection fraction. Uh, as opposed to 6.3% if they're less than 50. Now, there are very few patients in these studies who are 70, 80 years old. So a caution in using this drug in older people, you have to monitor patients on this therapy every three months with some measure like a MUGA scan or an echocardiogram, which adds the cost and expense because of this potential risk, because it can sneak up on you. And even though you listen to everybody's chest and check them, uh, you can uh, get a profound drop in ejection fraction uh, before symptoms. So in a lot of older people who are good candidates for the therapy, we're taking a more proactive approach. Uh, and that includes uh, cardiac uh, referral to a cardiologist and considering proactive use of ACE inhibitors and beta blockers, which uh, can be very effective in managing this toxicity. So unlike anthracycline toxicity, uh, drugs like adriamycin, which actually damage heart muscle, and you get your heart muscle replaced by fat. Here you don't get damage to the heart muscle like that, and apparently the heart can make a comeback when the drug, drug is stopped. Uh, so uh, this is a really good option. And in addition, we're learning about regimens that are as good uh, as older regimens that contain anthracyclines, uh, that don't contain anthracyclines, that limit the risk of heart damage in these patients. So what's happening with all of this? Well, we're making major headway. And if you look at uh, dying, risks of dying of breast cancer, they're dramatically uh, improving uh, over the last decade. So you can see in white patients, there's been major improvements starting in the mid-90s. Uh, and in African-American patients, there have been improvements, except in older patients. And this is really a challenge of research, how to get a lot of these older African-American patients. Many of them are poor or in neighborhoods with bad access. They can't get in all the time to get them uh, more screening and better adjuvant early therapy for their breast cancer. Actually, UNC has a lot of social programs for these patients, but they're not, that's not true nationwide. The other thing we've learned is undertreatment is, is, is very bad. Uh, a lot of patients say, well, you know, she's 80 and, uh, uh, you know, she's got a little high blood pressure. Why worry about the breast cancer? Well, in Canada, they looked at a, a group of patients and they looked at uh, simple guidelines, such as you're a uh, patient with hormone receptor positive breast cancer, you should consider tamoxifen. Very simple types of guidelines. And in this study, which is done in Quebec, where they have a large database, they looked at a large group of patients, about a quarter of them were 70 and older. And they showed if you conform to guidelines versus not conforming. And these weren't like 30-page guidelines. This was like one page of guidelines, uh, very simple. There was about a difference in about 20% in the relapse rate. So using some form of guideline, practice guidelines, not just with breast cancer, but with all uh, medical illness, uh, can frequently lead to much better outcomes. Now one of the questions is, a lot of the chemotherapy today is pretty aggressive. You know, we treat people for eight weeks, we give them growth factors, everybody loses their hair. Um, we have come a long way with antiemetics, but it's still very, very tough on people to go through chemotherapy. So what we did was we looked at large clinical trials in older, in patients who had po no positive breast cancer, and we looked at the cancer and leukemia group B, one of our cooperative groups, uh, and we took uh, essentially 6,000 patients, and we went back and we looked at how they did in the clinical trials. And every one of these clinical trials compared more aggressive with less of aggressive chemotherapy over a 20-year period. You can see we got 6,500 patients, but look, 
we only got 10% of patients, uh, excuse me, 8% of patients 65 and older. Mm -hmm. Now, we should have many more patients if we're putting, uh, if we're offering trials to all our patients, but we really didn't. So in spite of the fact this is a national cooperative group, UNC is a member, Duke's a member, Wake Forest, we didn't, we didn't do very well in accruing, in accruing older patients. And moreover, there's a bias to the type of older patients we did accrue. So this is node status versus age. And you can see if a woman was uh, less than or equal to 50, she, and she had 10 positive nodes or more, uh, you could see that only 11% of those patients went on these trials. Because at that time, a lot of bone marrow transplant and high-dose chemotherapy was being done. But look here in the women 65 and older, a quarter of them had 10 or more nodes. So we tended to put older people who were pretty healthy, but who had higher risk breast cancer on these trials. Nevertheless, uh, we showed that if you looked at all patients, so here's all 6,500 patients, more chemotherapy was better than less chemotherapy. And the absolute difference in, and these are all survival curves, Kaplan-Meier, the absolute difference is maybe about 5 to 10 percent. Doesn't sound like much, but considering 250,000 new patients a year with breast cancer, big impact. If you looked at here, the older patients, more versus less, they had similar proportional benefits from more aggressive treatment. So it, it really was helpful to them uh, as well. But if you look at their Kaplan-Meyers, here's 0, 20 years, 65. Very few of the people are alive at 85, 90 years old because they're dying of other causes. So actually, a lot of these patients died of other causes. The other thing is toxicity. So this is a great comment. If your time hasn't come yet, not even a doctor can kill you. But that's not true for medical oncology. We can. Uh, and uh, these are data by toxicity in the same group of patients. Now, it's very interesting here. If you look at univariate analysis, you don't really see large differences in toxicity in these clinical trials of older versus younger patients. Although in multivariate uh, models, as we get older, we have less bone marrow reserve. But older people actually, if anything, have a little less nausea and vomiting and other problems. Uh, actually, they have much better psychosocial function on trials than younger people. They're not worried about their kids and daycare and uh, a lot of other things in their career that younger women uh, have to deal with. But what we also found out is when you go in these big clinical trials, they're probably not representative of the population. So um, the observed um, uh, black line, well, the observed, what do I do here? I want to do that. The observed black line here is a CLGB trial. So the x-axis is time, and the y-axis is percentage of pe people dying. So here's the people on all these breast cancer CLGB trials, the older people, 65 and older. And here are the people in the US population without breast cancer from the Social Security database. So when you went in our CLGB trial, even with breast cancer as an older person, you actually live longer than your neighbors down the street in general who are the same age. And the reason is, to get on these clinical trials, you had to be healthy, you couldn't have bad renal function. So these data are really not generalizable to that frail patient who comes in your office who takes you and your nurse 15 minutes to get on the examining table. And we don't know a lot about those patients. And that's really a challenge of our research. So in summary, adjuvant therapy in older women, uh, we need to assess their survival. And then as we talked about, we would generally treat them like younger women. And these, are, uh, these slides will be on the web for these details, but uh, essentially treat them like younger women. Now what about clinical trials in older women? One of the reasons people like me and others are uh, interested in this topic. Well, clinical trials in general are kind of abysmal uh, in the U.S. right now in older adults. So if you look here, y-axis logarithmic, the kids, the, uh, the pediatric oncologists do a great job getting their kids on trials. But look at these adults. This is one out of 100. And look, even by age group, we're only getting 1% of our cancer patients on NCI and other sponsored trials. And it's not getting better. It's getting tougher with bureaucracy and less money, et cetera. 
Look at 80 plus log access, 0.1, that's one out of 1,000. So it's been very tough to get these people on clinical trials. So the question has come up, do we need a right trial specifically for older patients? And the answer is not categorically yes or no, but certainly uh, developing a specific trial for an older patient can be helpful. So this is a trial that we did in the Cancer and Leukemia Group B, and what we did, we designed it for 65 and older, and we randomized these patients to either standard chemotherapy or capecitabine. So capecitabine is an oral 5-FU prodrug. Its trademark is Zalota. And we had hoped that an oral drug in older people, uh, if it was equivalent, so this was a non-inferiority trial, would be very helpful. And that would, because it would be logistically easier uh, on patients, et cetera. So we set up this trial, uh, and we actually got 600 patients on it, which exceeded like our 20-year uh, entries into all our other node positive trials. These patients weren't, uh, tended to be higher risk, uh, but sadly, we found out that standard chemotherapy was superior to capecitabine. So we had wanted to do something simple for older people, but found out it wasn't as good. Uh, and this kind of was a heartbreaker um, for us because we wanted to see if we had an oral uh, treatment. And there are issues like compliance, the people take the pills, et cetera. We actually had an electronic pill bottle as part of the trial and other things, but uh, shows the, the value of trials in older people and perhaps why you can't uh, just assume uh, that uh, a single agent uh, with really good preclinical and phase two data would be as good as standard treatment. So there are other trials ongoing worldwide, but I want to point out some of the problems. We completed our trial, and we actually published this trial in the New England Journal of Medicine a few months ago. The Germans have recruited 1,400 women to a trial that uses ibandronate, which is a uh, bisphosphonate. Uh, and there's some evidence they can be helpful in breast cancer and lowering risk of recurrence, not just for bone health, with capecitabine or no capecitabine. I give them credit. This will be one of the largest trials. But look at this. They're, these are the big trial. This is a group that put 10,000 patients on a hormone trial comparing tamoxifen uh, with letrozole, and they closed this after 42 patients because they couldn't get the older patients on it. This trial is ongoing in Naples comparing uh, docetaxel with CMF. And this trial in the UK, 1,000 patients uh, closed. They couldn't accrue enough patients. So the problem is getting patients big centers, getting referrals, offering patient trials, getting their consent, uh, et cetera, a major problem. Now ending up, what about us here at UNC? Uh, what are we doing here? So yes, we're a member of large cooperative groups, uh, but if you look, here is our 2008 data on cancer patients uh, at UNC. And you can see we had, uh, we had about, th we had 3,500 new cancer patients at UNC in 2008, and a third of them, about 30% of them, were 65 and older. So we're a, we're a referral center. We tend to get a lot of younger patients. We get pediatric patients. And still walking in here, 30% of our patients were 65 and older. So our goals here are, obviously, we all are going to want to do the best patient care. But we need to educate people about issues related to older patients. And here we have a wonderful geriatrics division. Uh, you know, just excellent care. And a lot of the students and residents get exposure. But in hematology, some of our fellows may have come from places that didn't have that kind of training. So we're working on that. And then a lot of faculty, especially older oncology faculty, uh, aren't aware of all these data on cancer in older people, managing comorbidity, other illness. So there's a lot of educational needs. And then for research, we're interested in translational projects, uh, risk of treatment, uh, and cancer site-specific trials. So here's just a list of projects uh, that we've ongoing. Some of them were here before I came, uh, Dr. Sanoff, uh, uh, Dr. Sharpless, and others looking at, and I'll talk just briefly about the P16 gene as a biologic marker of aging, but we have several uh, studies in progress now in colorectal cancer, breast cancer, et cetera, uh, that are ongoing. 
And what we've just done is develop the Carolina Senior Protocol. So this has been IRB approved, and hopefully we will start putting patients on on Monday. And so every new patient, 65 and older, who comes into the new cancer hospital, outpatient, uh, and speaks English. We are working on Spanish now, but we don't have the uh, capability yet. We'll get a brief geriatric assessment, and then this will be stored in the big cancer data warehouse that's being developed here. And it'll be useful for all of you who have interest in cancer in older people for descriptive studies, what do our patients look like, what's their uh, what's the demographics? Treatment and toxicity studies. Do you want to carve something out? Do you want to do a prospective study? And then translational research, last of all. So this will start accruing patients Monday. And we have a brief geriatric assessment. A geriatric assessment includes things like functional status. A patient can have three diagnoses. Hypertension, diabetes, look great. Um, Another patient can come in with diabetes alone and tell you they can't walk two blocks to the store to buy groceries. It's very important. Those patients are going to have a shortened survival. Nutrition. Uh, older people tend to lose weight, and that's a bad sign. When they lose weight, they're actually going to have probably a shortened lifespan because older people losing weight frequently, it's uh, no interest in eating, don't have prepared food, no one reminds them about eating major problem. Brief cognitive function, psychosocial assessment, and then just looking at the drugs. How many drugs are they taking? And what's nice about this is it's self-administered. It's been developed by one of my colleagues, Artie Huria, at City of Hope, and it takes about 15 to 30 minutes. So if I was to refer a patient to Dr. Griganti for a complete geriatric assessment, it's going to take an hour or two at minimum. And it's not feasible. There's not enough geriatricians in America to see all these patients for this. So this will be very, very helpful, and we will be getting this going at UNC. The other thing is we have Ned Sharpless here, who's really just an incredible investigator and uh, molecular biologist. And he's looked at the P16 gene, which is a cyclin-dependent kinase inhibitor, part regulates the cell cycle. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, there are families of melanoma patients where they have uh, deletions of this gene and they're at increased risk of melanoma. Uh, and probably if you have mutations of this gene, you may be at risk of other cancers. But what's really interesting is this gene looks like a great molecular marker, molecular marker of aging. Uh, and I'll just show you what that looks like. So here is um, looking at uh, the log of the gene. Uh, versus age. So this is actually looking at smoking. So this gene expression will go up if you smoke more. And the problem is if you give it up, it won't drop your, your P16 expression, but it won't go up as fast as it was when you were smoking. So it's kind of defined and probably stays with you. But take a look at this uh, uh, graph for, t for several reasons. I wouldn't worry as much about the, tr the trend goes up, but see this is a log scale here. So for every decade of life, there's actually a log or two increase in P16 expression. If you look at other molecular markers of aging, like interleukin-6 that's been or telomere length, uh, their changes are very small. So for big studies or studies in individuals, they're not really as helpful. But P16 expression can vary greatly in a specific age group. So this is just looking more at smoking. This is looking at exercise. If you, the more exercise you do, the lower it's likely to be. So, and then uh, lastly, here's correlating it with IL-6. So it does correlate with the other molecular markers. So Dr. Sharpless and colleagues are world leaders in the, looking at this gene, many aspects. And we believe that this expression of this gene will go up with chemotherapy, with radiation. There's some preclinical data. So we want to look at it to see, will it predict toxicity? Will it tell us about outcome? Will it tell us about long-term survival? And this is going to be very helpful, and we're going to integrate this into a lot of our trials. And then lastly, survivorship. Uh, cancer's common. Cancer's going to be the leading cause of death if it's not uh, that right now in the United States. There's at least 10, 11 million cancer survivors we know about. I think there are many more. Uh, when my father's uh, nurse got breast cancer 
30, 40 years ago, you didn't even admit you had cancer. There are no databases, and we don't really know who's walking around in the population. Most common cancer survivors are breast, prostate, and colon. And of the, of the survivors, about 7 million are 65 and older. The, lar the age of the majority of cancer survivors in America is 65 years and older. So we've got to learn the effects of our treatment on those patients, on other diseases. And Don Rosenstein and colleagues in the Cancer Center are building a great survivorship program, so we hope to integrate research in that group as well. So no more the silent minority. We're becoming aware of the data, silent majority, uh, the older people with cancer. We're, we're learning about uh, uh, how they do in clinical trials, but it's been not very good, and we need many more trials. And you can see a lot of the trials we've started haven't been successful. We do need new trials focused on all older patients. Uh, fortunately, the older people are considered underserved populations by the NCI and the National Institute of Aging. So that may help us a, a lot. And then last thing, maybe the most important, older people vote. So uh, maybe they can, we can leverage them and lobby them to uh, uh, help us with uh, funding for trials. So no one wants to get old. I, was, I asked my wife, should I show this? She said, do it. Uh, no one wants to get old, but it is a reality. You know, this is a very youthful country. Everybody wants to be young. But the truth is, we, we, we are an aging population. Uh, and uh, we're not like Italy yet, where 20% uh, of people are 65 years and older, but we're heading there. And we're going to really uh, deal with it. So for those with more interest, we're having a retreat at the Friday Center, November 17th, 1 to 5. Here's my email. Uh, it's free. There's refreshments. If you're interested, please come. We'd love to have you. You can register through the Cancer Center. And then lastly, thank you for your attention. Questions. It's a great question. The question is, why are the pediatricians so successful in adults? So several reasons. One is there are fewer pediatric cancers. You know, they're dominated by leukemia, certain brain tumors. Secondly, if you were to go out and look at pediatric oncologists in the practice and community, you'll find almost none. If you get a pediatric cancer, you're at Chapel Hill, Duke, Wake, or something. If you look at cancer in the United States, most people are cared for in the community. There's very little support for community docs for the clinical trials. Um, and to me, the support that's been given is not really what they need. They don't need pamphlets in the office. They need time to talk with the patients, because clinical trials take a lot of time. Um, and uh, you, need, you need to invest either in skilled staff, or you got to do it yourself. And so it's, it's been a tougher thing. And I think the NCI is aware of it, but how to build in the time and to do it uh, has been tough. And it's a major problem because uh, about half the trials now that are industry sponsored, more than half, are going outside the US for many reasons. Less bureaucracy, um, getting through the system quicker through IRBs, et cetera. Frequently, captive populations. You do a trial in the Ukraine with metastatic breast cancer. You use a drug. They, they can't afford to buy any drugs. So you either go on the trial or don't be treated. It's an ethical problem, but it, that has nothing to do. You know, that's, that's the way it is. So it's a great question, and we need to do better. Yes, sir. So, so I think we're curing a lot of people. Uh, the, the term cure is always problematic in a disease here. It's like patients say, how do you know if the chemo worked? I mean, you're giving like prevention. It's like, 
I, I say we only know if it doesn't work. Um, so we are making great, st we've lowered the mortality rate cumulatively in breast cancer of, since the mid-90s by about 30 to 35 percent. And there have been a lot of research on it, and it's due to wider use of chemotherapy and hormonal therapy and better screening, better mammography, essentially. Um, so these small increments, these iterations of a few percent, have made a major difference because this is a common disease in millions, it, it, literally in millions of people worldwide. We're definitely looking for new drugs, and methylation of genes is so important. And there actually are drugs now being developed. Uh, in fact, there's one for leukemia, uh, uh, a histone deacetylase inhibitor that's been approved. It's not been, you know, a home run, but it's added a few percent. But it's spurred other industries and other pharma and NCI to develop more of these drugs. So there's a lot of interest in that. And people here like Chuck Peru and others uh, are really doing some beautiful work in looking at targeted agents here. So I think there's a lot of hope. What's not going to happen is the magic bullet. So public's always waiting to wake up one drug. It's never going to happen. Um, there are occasional home runs like platinum, the testis tumor in men. And I think the incredible thing, Lance Armstrong was cured, but so were all the other guys. I mean, he's given back. But more likely in breast cancer, colon cancer, uh, lung cancer, it's going to be uh, multiple targets. We already know they're, they have variability, great variability in genes. And we're going to need multiple targeted drugs. There's not going to be one simple pathway. We already know that. That's going to define the cancers. There may be four or five. And methylation may be one of them. So the U.S. is not the leader. Places like U.K. So breast cancer is a disease of affluence worldwide. So if you look at incidence rates, the U.S. Denmark, UK, Israel, well-to-do uh, countries t tend to have higher risk. African Americans have lower overall risks, but in the United States now they're catching up. You know, their li their healthcare is better, and they're catching up. And actually, younger Afri African American women have higher risks for reasons that are uncertain. So it's a disease of affluence. And if you look at uh, poorer countries, you know, I showed you that curve, that aging. The, you know, the average age of a woman may be 50, you know, in Sudan. And so they don't see the risk there, but they will see the risks as those countries improve and get better health care. So I don't think it's an environmental thing. I think it's longevity here. There's a lot of interest in the environment, um, a lot of money been put in, but there hasn't been one thing. And I also feel when you think about all the stuff we buy and that's in our houses, to sort it out it is almost impossible. So I think it's a mixture of things. And then the other thing in affluent countries is obesity after the menopause. So we make estrogens by uh, weak uh, androgens coming out of the adrenal glands. And then the aromatase enzyme is mainly in fatty tissue. So people who are obese, like 60, if you compare a group of obese people with non-obese people, the obese people have much higher estradiol levels. And in virtually all studies, it's that estradiol turning over the cells, the DNA, making errors, increased risk of breast cancer. So it's really, I think, a lot has to do with affluence lifestyle uh, of wealthy nations uh, and increased longevity as opposed to an environmental problem. Hi, I think we're going to have to stop. And those of you who have questions, you can come up afterwards. We'll have to let people go. Thank you very much. Thank you.